Once again, Britain and France are at war with one another. This has happened periodically during the time that we have been talking about. And if the United States uh, really complied with the rules of one nation, then they tended to uh, irritate the other. And so it was kind of a thin line that the United States walked. Well, in 1807, uh, a British ship fired upon the American ship Chesapeake, uh, killing three men and wounding 18. A British search party then seized four men from the ship. And so you have war fever beginning to rise in the United States. This was not the first time that the British had stopped an American ship and taken Americans off of the ship to put into their navy. This practice was called impressment. Basically, a British ship would stop an American ship and they would impress or force men to join their navy. They said that they were taking British citizens that, had, that were sailing on American ships, but a lot of times they also got Americans. To avoid war, Jefferson decided on an embargo. In December 1807, Congress passed the Embargo Act, which stopped the export of all American goods and prohibited American ships from clearing for foreign parts. But the embargo was a failure. Those who complied with it were going to go bankrupt. It's going to bring about a real economic depression in the country. And then there were those who simply ignored it, and they would say they were selling to a certain place. And then once they got out far enough away from land, would head for Europe anyway. It was impossible to enforce the act, and so on March 1st, 1809, he repealed the, art, the embargo and shortly left office. Now, the new president was James Madison, the former Secretary of State for Jefferson, and from the beginning of his term of office, he's going to be involved in foreign problems. There, there were efforts to try to get our shipping protected. That's not going to really work. There were issues about impressment. Uh, a lot of Americans were concerned because the British had never left some of the forts in the Western territories that they were supposed to after the American Revolution. And so the irritation was there. The people, who, And so there were people who really began pushing for war. They're going to be known as the War Hawks. They were Southern and Western Republican congressmen led by Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. And so all of these things came together to where on June 14, 1812, the United States declared war on Britain and the War of 1812 had begun. It, this war will also be known as Mr. Madison's War. Uh, the American Army was pretty outnumbered at the beginning. It was not really prepared at all for a war. The ships, our ships, the Navy was pretty good, all 16 of them, but, um, and in the first year they're going to produce the only real American victories that we have, but within a year the British had blockaded the coast except for New England where they hoped to cultivate anti-war feeling, and so most of the little American fleet wasn't able to really do much after that. Gradually, the war had begun to turn in favor of the Americans, but then it got scary again in 1814. A British force of 4,500 of the command of General Robert Ross landed without opposition in June at Benedict, Maryland and headed for Washington, D.C., 40 miles away. To defend the capital, the Americans had a force of about 7,000, including only a few hundred regulars and 400 sailors. So they had militia, and militia did not have a good reputation in this war. There had been an earlier case where uh, an American army had crossed into Canada to attack, and the militia were on the, the U.S. side. They could hear the army of regulars being uh, fired on on the other side and when ordered to go across to help them had refused saying that their commission was only for them to serve in the United States. So you really couldn't always count on the militia at this point and that's what's going to happen here. Uh, at Blandensburg, Maryland, the American militia melted away in the face of a smaller, this smaller British force. Only the sailors held firm but even they were finally forced to retire because they were so outnumbered. On the evening of August 24, 1814, the British marched unopposed into Washington, where British officers ate a meal prepared for the President and Mrs. Madison, who had joined the other refugees in Virginia. The British then burned the White House, what is today the White House, it was the President's house, the Capitol, and all other government buildings except for the Patent Office. Now, this was so close, uh, Dolly Madison had stayed in the president's house. She had even had a meal prepared thinking that her husband might come home from the army where he had gone to be with the troops. 
and she's getting pushed by her servant saying, the British are coming, you've got to get out of here. She saves this ver the very famous portrait of George Washington and other historic documents from the house, gets into a carriage and leaves. British troops come into the president's house, sit down, and the food on the table is, st is still warm. So that's how close they came to capturing the president's wife. They didn't destroy the patent office because the man in charge of that made this really impassioned plea for science, saying that it had nothing to do with government, that it was all scientific thought in there, and these were proposals for inventions, and so the British opted not to burn the patent office. This army then headed for Baltimore. There, things are going to go differently for the British. When the British arrived at the city in September, they halted in face of the American defenses that were there, and then all through the night of September 14th, the British fleet bombarded Fort McHenry, which was on an island in the harbor and held by the Americans. And Fort McHenry is still there today. You can go and visit it. Finally, the British, um, and as this siege is going on, this attack is going on, there is a lawyer named Francis Scott Key who has kind of been detained by the British. So he's in the harbor, he's watching this fleet, and he's wondering if, the, if Fort McHenry can hold. And so he's waiting for dawn to see if the U.S. flag will still be flying. When dawn comes and the flag is still flying, he then sits down and writes um, a, basically a poem. The sight of that flag uh, in place inspired him to draft the verses of the Star Spangled Banner, and it will become our national anthem in 1931. Now, another British army heads for New Orleans. Uh, this is, of course, a very prominent and important port, so they kind of it controlled the Mississippi. And if they could control New Orleans, they could cut the, the lifeline of the West. Now, in charge of defending New Orleans from the British was Andrew Jackson. The British were led by Sir Edwin Packingham. Uh, he didn't think much of Jackson or his force that he had managed to put together. This was... Uh, freed slaves. Uh, it was uh, pirate Jean Lafitte there was was with him. He put together anybody who could fire uh, a, a rifle, got the area as fortified as they could, and waited for the British who marched, as the British did in those days, across an open field in the front, you know, towards this uh, in this army that's made up of pirates who are pretty good fighters who have been who have fortified their position and before the British withdrew some 2,000 had died on the field including Packingham himself whose body pickled in a barrel of rum was returned to the ship where his wife awaited news of the battle and they would take him back to England for burial and this attack happened on January 8, 1815. Now, it occurred after the priest treaty had already been signed, but it wasn't an anticlimax because had the British won, you know, maybe they would have said, no, we're going to renege on the priest treaty. Uh, things could have gone different. So it really kind of assured that that peace treaty would be officially followed. Uh, the Treaty of Ghent, signed December 24, 1814, simply agreed the, uh, to end the war. Prisoners would be returned. Previous boundaries would be restored, and it really didn't sell anything else. But interestingly enough, from this point on, the United States and Great Britain began to reestablish their relationship and their friendship, which has continued to this day with Great Britain being our biggest ally. And so, and that relationship really kind of starts again after the War of 1812. Now, while the diplomats were putting together this peace treaty, uh, a different kind of meeting was happening in, Har in Hartford, Connecticut. This is going to be the Hartford Convention. There were some in New England who wanted to uh, not have any part of this war. They uh, made profits from illegal trading. And uh, so they held this convention. And they assembled delegates from the legislatures of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, Vermont, and New Hampshire. There were 22 in all. And it proposed seven constitutional uh, amendments designed to limit Republican influence. Now, this convention was made up totally of Federalists. And they were really trying to make it a point to where the Federalists would be able to come back and take the presidency. And so they were trying to kind of change some of the things that they thought had helped to make it possible for the, for the Republicans to be elected. 
and their call for a later convention in Boston carried the unmistakable threat of secession if the demands were ignored. Yet that threat quickly evaporated. When messengers from Hartford reached Washington, they found the Capitol celebrating the, the news from New Orleans and that the peace treaty had been signed. And the consequences were a fatal blow to the Federalist Party, which never recovered from the stigma of disloyalty stamped on it by the Hartford Convention. And many historians really feel that the United States became a country at this point, that this was the final thing that really unified the country and kind of made us a country in the eyes of Europe, more so than it had been prior to this time. And that's it for this time.